Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, U.S. Strategy, Trade Strategy, Asia, and my guest is Mr. Russell Honma, a trade specialist and often an often visitor to ThinkTech Studios. Welcome to Asian Review. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Bill Sharp. I remember when I first met you, was it like in 1990, when you were the president of a Japan uh, American Society in Hawaii. And oh. that's when I was just starting out to learn what uh, all about U.S. and Japan was going through. And I know that you're quite a, a mentor to me back oh, then. Oh, wow. Thank you for the compliment. That's really nice of you. Well, let's sort of get right into it, because as always, our time always goes faster than we want it to go. Well, is there a coherent U.S. trade strategy? Right now, between your, in terms of Asia Pacific right. region? Right. Uh, definitely, I know that our United States Trade Representative, uh, uh, Robert Lighthizer, is kind of looking at the, uh, seeing if we can rejoin the TPP again, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, they call it comprehensive, progressive uh, TPP now. And uh, there's only 11 members right now besides United States. I know when Donald Trump, the president, made an announcement when he went to the World Economic uh, Forum in Davos, Switzerland, he mentioned that the uh, United States is interested in rejoining the TPP. And I know that, like in China, uh, we're not a member of the RCEP that China is pushing with the ASEAN country plus six nations. Right. And uh, so and vice versa, China is not a member of uh, TPP or the so-called comprehensive progress of TPP. But do we have a, a, a comprehensive, uh, coherent, organized tr U.S. Uh, Asia trade policy? It seems to me it's kind of scattered. We talk about getting back into uh, TPP. Exactly. We talk about uh, you know uh, re re renegotiating the chorus uh, Korea U.S. FTA. We talk about getting into this uh, trim down form of, of, of TPP. Um, and we, we talk about bilateral investment treaties here and there, but I, there doesn't seem to be anything coherent to me. Yeah, actually, they, I guess what the, the President Trump is trying to do right now, he wants to put everything, instead of going to the multilateral or trilateral basis, he wants to focus on the bilateral trade agreement, like country to country, mm -hmm. and see what the pro and the cons are, and see what the strengths and weaknesses are in the trade agreements. And uh, I know that he's kind of focusing right now on China, because uh, China trade agreements, are, or uh, he wants to see if we can come up with a vital bilateral trade agreement with, with China. China. Mm. I, that, that's interesting, because I know that he, I've heard lots of talk about a possible bilateral investment treaty with Japan, and I think that's something probably Prime Minister Abe and Trump are going to talk about this week in Florida. But I, I hadn't heard that about a bilateral trade investment treaty with China. Mm -hmm. I know that when President Barack Obama was a president, we're focusing at that time was having this uh, U.S.-China investment and in technology transfer agreement. And uh, we had our trade representative back then working on the deals, but hopefully when the, when uh, President Barack, I mean uh, Donald Trump came in office, he start uh, he wanted to renegotiate with all those uh, trade agreements or the trade issues that uh, President Barack Obama had brought up with these trade representatives. So, what do you think about this strategy, the Trump strategy? It's hard to tell what his strategy is because he changes from day to day, but. Let's take this this um, bilateral approach. What do you think about this? Bilateral approach, bilateral approach, bilateral approach, and then maybe ultimately some sort of multilateral approach. What's your take on that? Well, I think he's just kind of uh, kind of playing this hard to get kind of approach. Uh, and instead of, uh, I think, being a former developing the construction industry uh, executive, that he wants to see what the strength and the weaknesses are, and see if we can make any improvements from those trade agreements or those trade discussions that's been going on. And unlike in uh, China's case, I know that he was there. When I spoke last time uh, with your colleague, uh, Mr. Jay Fiddle, we talked about the retaliative measure on the tariffs, where uh -huh. uh, uh, where United States was going to put 25 percent tariffs on steel and 10 uh -huh. percent uh, uh, tariffs on aluminum. So that kind of triggered everything, and uh, and hopefully 
that uh, China is trying to retaliate, saying that if they if they do that, we're going to put fifty billion dollars of uh, uh, retaliatory measures, just like we came up with the fifty billion. Now we're putting bringing up the ante up to hundred billion dollars. Wow. wow! So that will, that might create a, like a trade war. Yeah, let's get to that trade war just a little bit later. But let, let, let's focus on TPP for right now. Just just the other day, the Australian, I believe he was a trade minister. I uh, made a very bold statement saying, look, um, we're really not into renegotiation of anything. And that statement was aimed at the White House. And it seems to me other countries that have stuck with TPP, they're not really willing to do this renegotiation because their neg ne negotiations for TPP took a long time anyway. So what do you think is going to happen if... The U.S. says it wants to get back into TPP, but it's not willing to renegotiate. And all these other countries are putting up a pretty solid wall. Does that mean U.S. participation in TPP? Is this done? Or, or what's your take on that? I think it's going to be open. You know, it's just, you know, maybe if... Uh, I know that our prime minister from Japan, Abe Shinzo, is going to be meeting... Uh, President Donald Trump next week, I mm -hmm. believe, uh, maybe, I think it was on the 17th, so mm -hmm. two days from now, uh -huh. and hopefully uh, he's going to bring up that issue that, because uh, uh, I know that Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and all the other 11 uh, members of the TPP wants United States to rejoin into this new comprehensive progressive TPP. Right, <clears throat> right. Well, um, let me ask this question. This question goes a little bit beyond trade, but obviously the U.S. had the rebalance to Asia, which seems to be no one talks too much about it these mm -hmm. days. And the economic side of that was TPP. And then the U.S. pulled out of TPP, we don't hear very much about the pivot or the rebalance to Asia mm -hmm. anymore. If the U.S. gets back into TPP, does that give new life, does that breathe new life into the pivot? Well, if you look at the trade volume, I think, because uh, uh, United States has roughly like $18.7 trillion of gross national products, so mm -hmm. that's how much business that's uh, per capita we, uh, uh, we're generating. Mm -hmm. So if you look at and calculate that with the numbers with the 11 countries, uh, we're going to have like 40% of worldwide uh, domestic, uh, GNP or gross domestic sales. Mm -hmm. So that's going to give a lot of leverage. And I know if you look at the RCEP, what China is trying to do right now with the ASEAN plus six countries, uh, which uh, basically the six countries are Australia, China, India, South Korea, New Zealand, Japan. And ASEAN 10 is like Brunei, Burma, or they call it Myanmar, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. They're the 10 countries. And mm -hmm. some of these countries in the uh, RCEP belongs to TPP as well. Uh, so they get both leverages. I know Japan belongs to the TPP, and they're part of the RCEP Six Nation. Uh, Singapore is a, a country as well, and Vietnam. So they get a little leverage. They can dual, play dual they, membership. Dual membership, exactly. Mm. So if you look at the membership, uh, it's kind of interesting how they play it out. <clears throat> That's very interesting, very interesting. Uh, well, speaking of Prime Minister Abe's trip to um, Florida this week, what do you think will be the outcome of that? Well, I think they just want to make sure that... Uh, Maybe Prime Minister, they might bring up the issue with North Korea issue. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, with the denuclearization of the missiles and the weapons of mass destruction, right. uh, see, and they're going to have a meeting now with the South Korean uh, president, going to meet right. uh, the North Kim Jong Un. Hope, I think on April 27th of this uh, month, right. and the end of May, uh, they want to try to set up a meeting with Kim Jong Un and Donald Trump. Right. And we're having uh, when I talked on the last show, uh, uh, they're going to try to see if we can do a meeting in Hawaii, since we, we have a uh, Pacific Command here with the RIMPAC as well. So that might kind of have a good uh, ideal location, might be East-West Center or the Pacific Security That would be uh, really interesting. I, I imagine Council. the Korean-American community <clears throat> and, and Korean citizens of the Republic of Korea living in Hawaii would, would I would guess, 
we'll put together fairly large mm -hmm. street demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to another, besides the, arts, uh, the meeting with Abe Shinzo, not only the North Korean issue, but I think they might want to talk about United States rejoining the Comprehensive Progress TPP. Right. That might be the second issue. And I know that Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe has been pushing the uh, so-called uh, high-speed rail transit project, the Shinkansen project in the North America. I know there's one project going on in California, right. high-speed rail uh, uh, project, and there's one in the uh, East Coast with the Northeast Corridor. They're coming with the uh, Ma maglev technology with the HSST. Is that, is that from New York to Washington? Uh, yes, from uh, going from New York, uh, actually goes from Washington, D.C., Maryland, to New York, to uh, Boston, to Philadelphia. And they call I'm it the Northwest Corridor. Okay. And there's another project, it's a private funding project from uh, Texas, which is from uh, Dallas, Texas to Houston. Uh -huh. And uh, they call it Texas Central. And they're using the N700 uh, uh, technology for the bullet train concept. Oh, is and that right? <coughs> oh, that's really interesting. I know that they have, um, I, I um, since my my sister lives on the East Coast. I go to the East Coast a couple times a year. Uh, well, at least I did when my mother was alive. Now I probably only go once a year. And I sometimes go to Washington to talk to all the folks in the think tanks and see what the inside the Beltway thinking is. And I take the uh, Amtrak to Sella from Washington mm -hmm. to Philadelphia. That's a pretty nice train, but not as fast as the mm -hmm, Shinkansen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Yeah. I know the Amtrak, uh, they own most of the high-speed rail tracks, so I'm sure we have to get the Amtrak involved. Right. And uh, hopefully they got the right away, so maybe possible some kind of joint venture would be, uh, might be coming out of this deal. That'd be very interesting. That would be really interesting. I know in California, Governor Brown has is putting a lot of priority on that uh, uh, high-speed rail to go right down the Central Valley. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he, as I understand it, thinks it'll be a big job career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, okay, TPP, we pretty well talked about that. Oh, you know, one other thing I think we just, it's not really a trade issue, but let's just touch on it anyway. Um, there are several, I think there's something like 12 uh, Japanese citizens being held captive in, in North Korea. Mm -hmm. They were abducted mm -hmm. from the shores of mm -hmm. Japan by... Um, I guess you would call them North Korean frogmen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm sure, and I think you would agree, but if you don't, just tell me, mm -hmm. um, that Prime Minister Abe will bring this up to President Trump, that when you talk to Kim Jong-un, you know, tell him that we're concerned about those 12 abductees mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we want them back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that, that happened already, I think, when they first met in La Largo. Uh -huh. And they made a press release that I know President Donald Trump mentioned about those uh, seven family, the remaining uh, captivity that was uh, kidnapped. I remember when I was a child, and, you know, born and raised in Japan, my mother used to tell me, that means that be aware with the North Koreans. So there's a lot of rumors among the uh, Japanese mothers that telling their children to be aware of the North Korean because there was a lot of this kidnapping, uh, dachimondai, they call it in Japanese. Oh, I see. <coughs> uh, that's interesting. Uh, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to come up. And I, I would think that uh, President Trump would be sympathetic to that if somehow he didn't think that it would inter interfere or disrupt his negotiations or chat with Kim Jong-un. Um, anyway, um, so what do you think? Are we going to have a trade war with China? Uh, I don't think we would. To me, you know, it's still the negotiation. Got, it takes about six months, I would say, based on uh, 90, first 90 days, they're going to see if the negotiation is going to work between our United States uh, uh, trade specialists that focuses on China. And uh, I know that the Chinese has their uh, officials that's working on a deal right now. So see how it's going to happen. And I noticed that last week in uh, Bao, Hunan province, they had the uh, the Hun Bao Forum, Economic Forum in Hunan. Let's yeah. stop right there because I, I'm getting told we need to take a break. and. You know, we have to uh, pay our respects to all of those that support us. So you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Mr. Russell Homma. He's a trade specialist. And uh, our show, uh, U.S. Trade Policy Asia. And we'll be right back.
Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And see you then. from the Foundation for a Better Life. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Mr. Russell Hunla. He's a trade specialist with a vast amount of experience in the area. Our show today is U.S. Trade Policy Asia. Uh, we've been talking about some of the salient issues, uh, our trade issues uh, facing the United States, the possibility of rejoining the TPP, um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, visit with President Trump in Florida this coming this week, not this coming week, this week. Uh, and what that, um, that might turn up. And just before the break, uh, we're beginning to talk about the possibility of a U.S.-China trade war. So let's pick it up from there. And, um, you know, President Trump, um, he does say some things that do make a lot of sense, I think, is <clears throat> when it comes to China, for a long time, U.S. companies have been at a disadvantage. To enter the Chinese market, they have to sign over their technology to the Chinese government. They have to produce their uh, client lists. They have to enter into a joint venture with a Chinese partner. Uh, so it does seem pretty unfair. And obviously, China's ripped off, um, well, one way or the other, has ripped off uh, vast amounts of U.S. technology. And um, on the other hand, um, a trade war does seem a bit, um, I don't know, how should we say, excessive? And, um, but is it to be avoided? Will there, will there be a trade war or will it be avoided? I think if they, if they play it smart, I know the Chinese don't want a trade war, but they're saying that they, you know, if it happens, it happens. But, you know, right now they're seeing if they can, uh, if the trade war does happen in terms of, uh, our, we have a trade act from 1974, uh, where there's a section 301, mm -hmm. which talks about uh, retaliative measure uh, right. for dump, dumping law, selling the uh, merchandise below the fair market value, and that's what's happening with uh, China right now. And even with the uh, technology transfer, like you mentioned, when you want to do a joint venture in China, you have to uh, show all your manifests, your blueprints, your systematics, and how you're going to do the partnership. And a lot of these companies in China are state-owned enterprise. They're right. not actually a private uh, company. So right. when you deal with the state-owned enterprise, you know, they have their own little subsidiary company, so it's always that they're going to start up something on the side. And we know that it's been going on for about 20, 30 years already. We've been kind of looking at the other way with the copyrights and infringement of uh, licensing fees. Yeah, there seems to be uh, a kind of a pattern here when it comes to U.S. trade with, um, with Asia. It doesn't matter if it's South Korea, Japan, China, perhaps to a lesser degree, Taiwan. It's always like um, markets are kept fairly closed. A government, so most of these countries operate under industrial policy, where the government um, has a lot of influence on a company and what it's to do, even if it's a private company. And then there's government subsidies, uh, and then there's dumping. And, and for, the, for the benefit of the audience, we should probably explain what dumping is. Dumping is closing your market and then uh, penetrating another market and unselling uh, and selling under the market price in order to gain market share. And I think, 
I, uh, I, I don't like to say this, but I think I, and most Asian countries have been guilty of this at one time or another. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, Japan used to do that. I remember when we were, when you were the president of the uh, Japan American Society, we had that uh, close with the prime minister. Nakasone from Japan was a prime minister. We had Ronald Reagan was a president. So uh, we had, you know, they were kind of negotiating in terms of friendship kind of trade war. I mean, they, they came up with a structure, impetitive initiative talk between Tokyo and Washington and came up with some kind of measure with the terms and condition. And that kind of prevented the uh, trade war. And I think what's happening with in China and U.S. relationship, uh, we have to come with some kind of structure, impetitive initiative talks and come up with some kind of goals and objectives and what, uh, how we're going to approach this. And I think with our, our trade specialists and our, our senior officials are working on that deal right now. You know, this is really interesting. I, I lived in Japan in the 80s and there was a lot of, as you well know, there was a lot of trade friction between the United States and Japan at that time. On the strategic side, the U.S. and Japan were very close. On the economic side, there was lots of masatsu, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, friction. And I, you, you mentioned earlier Section 301. That was so prominently discussed in that day, sector-specific talks. In other mm -hmm. words, we're going to go down each sector of the economy and negotiate. And, and um, semiconductors were a huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm. And it's, to me, this is a little bit like deja vu, because I hear the same sort of language being brought up now in relationship to China. Mm -hmm. You know, Section 301, sector-specific talks, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. My, my fear is, just to share uh, a thought with you, is it always seemed in the 80s the U.S. side got out-negotiated by um, the Japanese side. The Japanese side was much better organized, much more inf better informed. They understood America quite well. Uh, lots of the tr Japanese negotiators had worked together as a mm -hmm. team for quite a long time. Many of them had studied in the U.S., got mm -hmm. advanced mm -hmm. degrees, and, and, and in most cases, very leading universities. Mm -hmm. English was very good. And then there was the U.S. side that got kind of thrown mm -hmm. together at the mm -hmm. last minute. They really didn't understand Japan very well, and mm -hmm. it was very unusual to find someone who spoke Japanese. And the U.S. side, they, they wanted a quick victory so they could run out to a microphone and, mm -hmm. and, and, and get a 30-second 30 second, 30 second, um, spot on the news. Right? Where the Japanese had a lot of patience and were somewhat tenacious, mm -hmm. I think they kind of ran over the U.S. And I'm just wondering if we're not going to see a replay of that, although this time the characters will be a little bit different between mm -hmm. the U.S. and China. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, I what's think, your take? I, you know, if you look at the uh, the government structure, Japan's was more like a socialist, and they kind of went to democratic government. Now China is uh, was a communist, is a communist country, but they're trying to move into the socialist kind of concept for their monetary and fiscal policy. So I think if you look at the uh, long run, I think. China is realizing uh, they have to be more democratic if you're going to go international and do businesses abroad. More democratic or more open? Uh, open and I, democratic. I have a feeling China mm -hmm. doesn't want to be a whole lot more democratic. <laughs> Maybe it will be less democratic. Yeah, I think the people want to be more democratic in those terms. But if you go into business, I think when you look going back, like Dao Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter what the color of the cats are long as they catch mice. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the history of the leadership, you know, we had Sun Yat-sen, remember, uh, he, he came to Hawaii, he studied at Punahou and Iolani, and his disciples of Mao Tao's Tong and Kam Chak Shek. Uh, and, uh, Shek. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they came to Taiwan, and, you know, they kind of broke away, and uh, so then they then came Dao Xiaoping, then uh, Hu Chintao, now we have a leader, uh, Xi Jinping, which uh, we, had, we just recently had that the uh, Communist People's Communist Party uh, Congress, and he said that they voted on him to be, he can have unlimited terms with no uh, years of uh, restrictions. So uh, I think he wants to be the next uh, Dao Xiaoping or Dao Mao Xiaoping, Tausing, long, yeah. Long-lasting <laughs> long fellow, long-lasting leader. Um, well, you know, I read a very interesting article. Actually, I brought it with me. It's from the, uh, it's called the Sino Insider. Maybe some of the folks in the audience mm -hmm. have heard of this. And the title is Risk Watch, Can China Withstand a Trade War? And it makes a very good argument that suggests, uh, not only suggests, but pretty strongly argues 
that in a trade war, the United States would be the victor because uh, China's economic situation is not as good as one uh, often thinks it is. Um, there's been a contraction of the manufacturing mm -hmm. sector. There's been an increase in unemployment. Uh, there, there's an increase in the, uh, the number of displaced manufacturer workers. Um, mm -hmm. Debt is increasing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, investors don't want to invest in China as much as they mm -hmm. used to because mm -hmm. China's become somewhat expensive. Uh, it's highly dependent on the U.S. as an export market. And if a trade war evolves, that China is probably going to be the loser. Yeah, I think uh, China. I think the, the leaders of China realize that. So when they formulate the BRICS uh, back in uh, when they had the World Cup in Brazil, mm -hmm. British uh, uh, actually it was uh, Brazil, uh, Africa, uh, Russia was involved, China, mm -hmm. and they came up with the. Uh, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, Investment mm -hmm. Bank. Right. And that's what that was a start in the One Belt, One Road initiative. And right. part of the One China policy and kind of bridge the gap between Euro-Asia kind of concept. Because they know that in order to bring in more domestic demand investments, they have to rely on these international partners. So the, uh, the strategy was coming with the uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, mm -hmm. in which the, you have to pay an ante of 10. If you're a small country, you got to pay like ten billion dollars into the pot to be mm -hmm. a member mm -hmm. and I know that United States and Japan is not a member because United States was both has a membership with the World Bank right and Japan is a leader in uh, with the Asian uh, Asia development, in, Bank. Yeah, the development Bank in Philippines right <clears throat> mm, that's interesting um, you know, uh, I, I see we're um, looking at the clock here. We're, we're, we're sort of whittling away at our remaining time here. Uh, and as I see it, we have about four minutes left. And a big part of this negotiation, a big part of the problem in trade is, um, uh, uh, is artificial intelligence. Obviously, China is striving to develop its artificial intelligence capabilities. The U.S. is, too. Um, this is really the, it seems like the key technology of the future. And who can ever master artificial intelligence is going to have a, a really big advantage, not only mm -hmm. when it comes to manufacturing and economics, but also in st strategic issues. Mm -hmm. In other words, in military sense. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that a lot of uh, the problems between China and the United States generally revolve around intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. I think China is focusing on, uh, I just went to a lecture in the uh, East-West Center, mm -hmm. and there was a professor from Canada who uh, mm -hmm. was uh, one of the leading for uh, focusing on China's zero sum uh, for artificial intelligence. And uh, he was mentioning how China wants to be a leader in the artificial intelligence. But if you look at the long one in diversity of artificial, like you mentioned, it could be military purpose, or it could be space technology, or it could be a uh, uh, humanoid kind of concept mm -hmm. uh, uh, that Japan is very advanced in humanoid, uh, having their CPU kind of concept right. and greeting. Uh, I know they're focusing on the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and right. uh, using robotics as our Tokyo to be a smart city concept. Right. So that's where artificial intelligence in terms of uh, uh, community uh, smarts concept right. is going to be applying. So, and they already have private companies and they're already uh, working on that, but China needs to do it in terms of internationally, not only for domestic demand, not only for in internal purposes. They have to go abroad and show that they can do the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and do commercialize it into business right. concept where the consumer can utilize that artificial technology. Right. Right. Well, we have uh, one minute left here, so let me just quick ask you this question. I just have to make this real brief. Um, there has been a renegotiation of the Korea-U.S. FTA. What's your take? Real uh, the, briefly. Uh, Korea, yes, I know that they, you know, Donald Trump said they're going to uh, not give any uh, tariffs on the steel and aluminum, and they want to renegotiate some of the free trade agreements. So I think that's... Uh, no, that's going to happen. I think we, we should keep that curious. And I know the Korean uh, uh, delegates uh, and the trade specialists are uh, supporting that measure. Great. And Korea is our ally. Right. And uh, they're our friends and our right. partners. Well, I guess we'll have to leave it there. Uh, as always, the time goes by faster than we like, to, like it to go by. 
So I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to thank our guest, Mr. Honma. And I'd like to remind you that next week our guest will be Mr. Liu Shuchong. He is the vice chairman of TITRA, the Taiwan External Trade Development Organization. Should be a great show. We'll see you then.